This episode is dedicated to our sponsors over on Patreon. Thank you all. Welcome back to Sci-Fi and Fantasy Read Along. I am ATN. I am Yule. And I'm DM Phil. Yeah, snake bite. <laughs> and uh, call, hey, hey, call me Pliskin. Uh, we're here. We're back together. As Philip pointed out, it's been like three months or more, and we are back to discuss Slaughterhouse Five. And we're going to discuss the first chapter today. It's going to take about nine or ten episodes to get the whole thing done, which is basically how the book is broken down itself. And today we discuss chapter one, which is essentially an introduction to the novel. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, it's it has the feel of a preface. Yes, it uh, does. Nothing that has anything to do with the actual novel you're going to be reading. I mean, I'm not sure about that yet because I haven't read the book. But Well, I mean, the way it's set up at the very beginning, it feels that way. It feels like a foreword or something. Yes. Yeah, forward. preface for sure. Casually, like I, I was under the impression that we were actually reading him writing, like Kurt Vonnegut. Mm-hmm. This whole first chapter, it just felt like him. In fact, like I went and read the wiki page of him just to get like kind of some background f- of him and it, it, a lot of the stuff that's in this first chapter really mirrors his actual life um it's not just the fact that he you know was in dresden there, there's quite a bit of stuff you know the teaching at the iowa writers workshop and you know stuff like that that so. was cool by the way i made that connection with uh steven erickson i was like i didn't even heard of it before but now you, you're like wow the iowa writers workshop that's like a big deal Mm-hmm. Without a doubt. I mean, obviously, just like anything, I'm sure there's uh, people that will poo-poo it. <laughs> yeah, people that didn't get in. Sure. Or, you know, oh, that's obviously you want to go there. <laughs> or people who are, like, bestsellers without having gone. Yeah, those people. Sure. Yeah. So, it's well, a very limited group of people It's are going to poo-poo it. It's the Harvard of literature, apparently. Nah. That's good. <laughs> it's a good writing school, supposedly. Harvard. But I wouldn't know. Um, right. So we're here. We're back. We're going to talk about this book. Hmm. This is Yule's pick, by the way. Yeah. Oh, because I read it one time. Yeah. Would you like I'm to glad know you about chose that? it. Like, it didn't even it didn't even occur to me to think about Vonnegut, even though he essentially is a he's a genre novelist. Well, thank you, Yule. Oh yeah, no problem. I hope we like it. So I read, like I said, I read it when I was younger, mm-hmm. and you know we used to party and hang out and whatnot and then you go home and you're still wired and while i was wired (laughs) i sat and read slaughterhouse (laughs) five entirely awesome how long did it take you read it one day yeah i read it like five six seven hours something like that 215 pages not that bad no not at all but you know it's it's like it gets that sci-fi tag because there's a lot of time and alien elements but you know, overall, you know, it gets placed in that like kind of anti-war. You know, um, yes, it was definitely all that picked stuff. up by that yeah. group of people as well. Well, I you mean, know, I, hey, yeah. just just running by you, Yule. But so, like, you know, um, I had no idea what Slaughterhouse Five was about, and so I read the first chapter. And what comes to mind is like, well, this isn't sci-fi. It's not fantasy. This is just like some historical documentary or some variation of that. Right. So you brought that up. And it's like it's classified as sci-fi. And I have not seen the connection yet. Did you get any hints at all? Because I got one hint yeah. throughout the entire first chapter. And it's when he, he says Earthling. No, I, I, I don't think I even caught that. Other than that, it was just you know how he spoke about certain things. But okay, yeah, go ahead. That's it. I mean, he used the word Earthling. Well, I'm excited to find out how it fits into the genre, but um, I mean, I love history and I love World War II stuff, so I'm still jazzed about reading this book. But I was wondering, like, how is how does this fit into our um, motif? Well, now see, this is like this is the benefit of doing a reread on something. You know, I mm-hmm. know of those things that are still in my head, the elements that you know of. You know, what is sci-fi in this book? You know, I'm not gonna obviously blow it for you. But now in the first chapter, I'm looking for all the things that are like, you know, little hints of what's going on. What did, things you, to what come. did you find? Well, there's a lot of, uh, well, he, he obviously is bouncing back and forth throughout the entirety of his life. Oh, and, wait, are you talking about the first chapter? Yeah, I'm talking book? about the very first chapter, you know. And, and, okay. and there's like, um, right from the very beginning, he lets you know that there's inconsistencies in his story. You know, yes, this is yes. all true. Well, except for this stuff that I'm making up, 
and for the most part this it's about this and then well if it's not about this and everything you're saying can i believe any of it is really what i'm asking <laughs> so an unreliable narrative no, without a doubt this guy is unreliable <laughs> I, I mean i understand where you're coming from but i didn't feel like he was particularly unreliable because of the way that it was written i felt it was really casual it was almost like talking to kurt vonnegut you've read him before though i mean his writing is pretty yeah. pretty easy to understand and kind of like you know it's a, a warm blanket type thing right i love him yeah no everything i've read by him so far has been great except for his first novel which i didn't love uh player piano mm -hmm. i just thought it was okay doesn't matter you don't have to love it all um did you guys notice the title slaughterhouse five title page of the book what does yours say because we have different versions i've got the mass market paperback well ours says uh, slaughterhouse five or the children's crusade and then it has all this other stuff to go you know that follows it a duty dance with death yeah by kurt vonnegut and then it explains who kurt vonnegut is mm -hmm. <laughs> a fourth generation german america now living in easy circumstances on cape cod and smoking too much who was an american infantry scout or de combat as a prisoner of war, witnessed the firebombing of Dresden, Germany, the Florence of the Elbe, a long time ago, and survived to tell the tale. This is a novel, somewhat in the telegraphic schizophrenic manner of tales of the planet Tralfamador, where the flying saucers come from. Peace. That'd be another, like, giveaway. I mean, that, that was definitely a clue. <laughs> hey, hey, Atien, thank you for re I completely forgot that I had read that when I first read this, and I didn't reread it on my second or third read, so I completely... Yeah, that's it says it right there. This <laughs> is the aliens. Flying saucers. You know, but the thing is, when I read that the first time, I'm actually kind of anxious to get to the actual story, so I just kind of breezed through it. I didn't comprehend uh -huh. it, and I breezed over it, and I didn't go back. Yeah. Something right there in those last few lines uh, says something sci-fi is going on. Okay. All right. All right. So do we have anything that we'd like to add before we begin talking about this novel? Um, I'm a fourth generation German uh, American and my family came from Helsdorf, Germany, which is actually between um, it's between Hanover and Hamburg. Doesn't really matter. We were, when we delve into German history, uh, World War II history like this, I'm usually a little bit sensitive. That's that's something in the back of my mind. I'm I'm kind of on edge when I read this stuff. Since you're saying that, <laughs> I uh, I looked into Dresden because my history and knowledge of stuff like that is pretty pathetic. Good. Thank you for doing that. And it's interesting because in this chapter, we find out that. It was, what What does he say? It's, it was as bad as Hiroshima. Before we start actually discussing the novel, can we get through the part where he's incorrect about that? Yeah, that's where I'm getting at. Well, explain explain what you're thinking about. So the deal is, is that Dresden wasn't as horrible when it comes to the number of deaths. And it was firebombed. It was. Um, for three consecutive days. And it was... It was bad. It was. And, you know, before or after people finalized the deal to stop fighting, that's, I guess, debatable. You know, that type of stuff. It's a whole Schwarzkopf situation. That is not the only source of discrepancy sure. in his story, though. The comparison to Hiroshima um, is based on a book that was written by a guy named Irving Frank. Mm -hmm. And Irving Frank's source for the number of dead in Dresden was taken indirectly from Goebbels' propaganda machine. Right. Which made the claim, they just basically added a zero to the end of the actual number of people that had died. And that gets picked up and, and continued to this day, and they use this book to like, hey, look at this. Mm. Well, that's true. I, it's uh, unfortunately, you know, the passing on of misinformation. But I, I think there's another... Yule touched on it. This was like a gem of Germany, you know, which, you know, the bro. Yeah, they're very proud of the city. And there was, you know, arguably not a lot of reason to bomb it at the end of the war. Well, that's it. It was three months from the end of the war. I mean, Germany was already on its knees. It was only, they had virtually no fighting and defense capability at that time. Hey, was, they were killing fools up until the very end. They, they were. Bomb yeah, they, everybody, they, you know. They were retreating in that direction and killing a lot of people, like a whole bunch of people, like 20,000. American soldiers died in the week before this. Well, that, yeah. yeah, that's I mean that was the Battle of the Bulge. This, so this was after the Battle of the Bulge, and and it is a little sad because uh, um, 
Um, Dresden was like packed full of German refugees. Somewhere between like 100 and 200,000 civilians were like packed into Dresden. And then they firebombed this thing. And the, yes, there were technically factories there. Yes, there were technically soldiers there. But there was no discrimination on who, who died. Well, they didn't even bomb the, the bridges. The, they weren't targeted. The factories weren't targeted. It was the city center. Anything that could burn is what they were aiming for. They wanted the city to go up in flames. That was a message sent, I think. <laughs> well, well they, they did say that. They're like, we, and then there were, you know, it was an American general, I think, that said, it's like, we want, German, we want Germany to know the, the risks of initiating a war. And I think that it was, it was punitive and unnecessary, and that's why people are, are really upset about it. Not just because of the twenty thousand or twenty twenty to twenty five thousand mostly civilian dead, but the point that it was unnecessary. Essentially, I think we can move past that part of it. That we've acknowledged the fact that the numbers are incorrect. The numbers that he refers to are incorrect. His citing of the source is known to be incorrect. But we're just going to look past that because from his vantage point on the ground as an actual POW in Dresden after the firebombing, helping clean up and remove bodies from basements and et cetera, I don't imagine it looked like a very pretty place. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that um, unreliable narrator um, one time. I'm going to really run through this. He mm -hmm. asked the um, military for, for information about the bombing and gets none. The Air Force, yeah. Yeah, the Air Force. And he also then gives, you know, these exact terms. You know, he says that it was as bad or worse than Hiroshima, right? The, that's unreliable. And he, you know, as a narrator, as, a, as an author, you have an out. You know, <laughs> what other people choose to do with your work is not your problem. <laughs> so I don't think it's a, really that big a deal to get hung up on it. I don't. I'm not hung up on it for sure. Or you, you don't feel like you're hung up on it either, I assume. No, you know. because you know we're going with a uh, concept here, and right. you know don't let uh, don't let facts get in the way of a good story. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, especially when you accept the fact that the narrator might be a little off. <laughs> well, did you feel did you feel that it's like, like that that was the narrator of the story, or did you I don't feel like know, that was but Kurt we Vonnegut? Just, we just read that very beginning, and under Kurt Vonnegut's name, it's talking about aliens. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you tell yeah. me where the story begins and where it ends. You know, well, I think it begins next chapter. Is I think what it I already think. began when we opened the book. Well, I mean, you can tell me later. I don't know, but it, it definitely felt like an introduction to a book instead of a story. Mm -hmm. You know, he comes back from the war at like the age 23 or so. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 23 years later, he's writing the novel in 1968, gets published in 1969. Um, and he's obviously struggled to write this novel. It took him 23 years to get it down on paper. At some point, he says that he wrote 5,000 pages and threw them all away. So he struggled to write this book, I think. I think that part is probably true. I, um, I didn't look I into it because I don't want to get spoiled, but does Vonnegut, did he have a hard time getting to this book? Like, was this, um, because yeah. this is this guy's first book, right? And now he's going to write all the other books, but uh, he had know. to get through this one. He had his life that he lived. No, and then he wrote I, I don't this think book. so. I don't think so. Because the, uh, when he, when he mentions the part about he was teaching at uh, the Iowa's right Iowa writers workshop. Mm -hmm. He says that a gentleman gave him a three book deal. Oh no. Yes. Okay. Okay. And he said that the first one would be the thing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that was his first book. Well, he was, uh, he was doing all that dispatch work. So like a lot of writers mm -hmm. back in the day would go through, you know, whatever military thing that they would do during a war. Um, mm -hmm. I find it in comic books also, you know, like the Jack Kirby and the Stan Lee, they were in the war, you know, one was doing more stuff than the other guy, newspaper guy <laughs> yeah, doing a Hemingway, but Hemingway even was out there getting like blown apart and trucks, you know, and then writing about the war and then comes back and writes his short stories and, and novels and stuff like that. And mm -hmm comic book guys doing their thing and um today vonnegut doing this thing i think you're you're a young man at that point in time like your odds of being in the war were a lot greater than sure. not being in the war well my, my first impression just the first chapter is that this this whole this whole book is his his way of coping with the horrors he saw oh yeah both vonnegut and the guy who's the narrator right 
<laughs> no comment. Think about that. It's Vonnegut writing a book about a narrator writing a who wrote a book about the war that they all experience. Well, yeah, but that guy is him. Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. yeah. Sure it is. <laughs> oh. You know, I did do a little research, too. And did you guys pick up on, like, Freeman Dyson, uh, the famous of, like, Dyson Sphere, the famous physicist who was British and then later American? So he worked for Bomber Command at the time, and he said that he'd also wanted to go back and write a book about Dresden. And he was obviously carrying a lot of baggage about it, but um he said i'm I'm so thankful that vonnegut wrote it because he did much better than i ever could have and now i don't need to write it and he gave him you know accolades for what he produced and even called him out on something he said it was truthful and he said the only inaccuracy that he found was that the night attack was was a solely british affair and the americans only came along afterwards to plow over the rubble and that's not that's not true but I think Freeman Dyson, in his own way, he blames himself and for, for that. And he had that baggage on his chest. So I think that this was a very important novel to a lot of people. And I'm starting to see that now. Do you think it's fair to call it an anti-war novel at this point? Oh, yeah. I mean, he clearly said that. In the, he said that to uh, whoever that uh, Hollywood producer was. Star, not Ken Star, but... <laughs> Vonnegut had kind of, I don't know if he pitched it or uh, on some way to this to this Hollywood producer and he's he compared it to making a movie making it making an anti-glacier movie which is you're as likely to to have an imp- it's inevitable you can't stop it yes why try why try yeah. however i would like to point out that now that glaciers across the planet are melting away I would also like to point out that war is extremely different now than it used to be. And also, in terms of body count, is melting away. We don't have the body counts. It never will again, hopefully. I tell you what, we still kill indiscriminately from our drones. <laughs> um, it's true, but it's it's also debatable whether or not a World War Three would look anything at all like World War Two. Oh, well, I, I can't imagine it would be. I hope we never find out. I also hope so. So, I mean, I thought that was interesting. And it was an anti... This is an anti-war novel. At least the first... He literally came out and said it's an anti-war novel. You know, to, to put it in perspective, is that this was, what, right during the Vietnam War was going on? Yeah, it was 1969 when it was published. Probably 68 when it was written. Yeah, and so that was a hot ticket item. Very unpopular war. Body bags were coming back. It was highly photographed and televised and... And it, that's the difference, is that Dresden, people didn't even know about. He seemed to think that everybody knew about it, and so why would it be kept a secret? Because the Air Force replied and said that that was confidential information that he had been asking for. And he's like, a secret from whom? So I, th- I think it was widely acknowledged that it had happened. Like, Hamburg also got, you know, firebombed in the exact same way. So these, I don't understand how these are secrets. All right, I got a question for you. Go ahead. Um, or I mean, were you going to answer that? No. Well, I you know I think it has to do with image of the military. Uh huh. But um, go ahead. Well, my whole thing is about you know recently it's you know kind of revisiting this whole like you know you got to separate the author from the work right. And if I were to do that, and I'm saying from this very chapter that this is an anti-war novel then shouldn't I just, like, not think about this chapter going forward if I was more along the lines of, you know, the death of the author, you well, know? No, that's a great question, Yul, and I, I think you know how we did the Stephen Erickson stuff where he was highly criticized for some things, and you then basically his defense was that you have to separate the author from the story. But this is, I think this is, we're in a different context completely. I think this story is integrally about the author. That, that may even be part of the point. You guys remember the uh, the Pillar of Salt thing? Yeah, the oh, very I end. remember it. Very last page, yeah. It's a really, really moving line, you know. It was how much he loved her, Lot's wife, for turning around, you know, and, like, she became a Pillar of Salt. He says, I loved her for that because she was yeah. so human in that moment. To look. Human. When you are willing to turn around and look at the past even as it's destroying you know it's going to destroy you to do so that's your most like human moment and he loves her for that that's uh powerful i like that my note there was that i mean he said i finished my workbook now the next one is going to be fun this one is a failure it had to be since it was written by a pillar of salt but 
I think this whole book is about something he had to get off of his chest. I think so, yeah. I mm-hmm. think so. Yeah. And I suspect it was very difficult to do, which is why it took him 23 years to do it. And why he had to talk his way into it, you know? Going to visit his buddy. Taking him back to the scene of the crime. Yeah, they even went back to Germany. <laughs> and they, he dedicates this to dude's wife and Mary the O'Hare. cab driver that yeah. they yeah. meet in Dresden. Yeah. Right. That's that's interesting. <laughs> it is. And so, hey, I, I'm going to throw this out there since we're, we're almost on the topic. The, I, I read about this when I was talking about, when I was reading about the destruction of Dresden. Um, in the 1976 Franklin Library edition of this novel, he wrote, The Dresden Atrocity, tremendously expensive and meticulously planned, was so meaningless, finally, that only one person on the entire planet got any benefit from it. I am that person. I wrote this book, which earned a lot of money for me and made my reputation such as it is. One way or another, I got two or three dollars for every person killed. Some business I'm in. And I, I think that theme of almost self-loathing and cynicism carries out through the entire first chapter. I think, yeah, it's, it does seem. I wonder if he's using the numbers... The revised numbers or the old bad numbers? <laughs> yes, I was. I did the same math. Is he adjusting for inflation also? Yes, I'm thinking he got paid four hundred grand or so. Yeah, and uh, not for. Well, maybe I don't know. Like, what, uh, I'm well, gonna have to look at that right now. Yes, did he get paid fifty to seventy five thousand, or did he get paid um, what uh, two hundred to three hundred thousand? It would have been four hundred. Okay. Oh the the goodness. numbers the numbers from Irving Frank are two hundred thousand dead or something like that. Yeah. What was amazing when I when I saw that it was like all right so that's the the wrong number it's twenty thousand Hiroshima it didn't it I don't know man you just sixty six you think it's gonna be like a hundred thousand two hundred it was the bomb you know they dropped the a bomb on them you know and it was. 60,000. I mean, I mean, that's horrible, obviously, <laughs> but it's a lot of, people it is a lot of people, bomb. but you know, you think about like atomic energy and I mean, there's been a lot of stuff to come as a result, you know, afterwards, radiation, all that other stuff. You can tell me more about that. I'm sure. But, um, uh, it, I don't know, you know, when you're a kid and you hear about the bomb and you see the explosion, you're like, damn, that must've taken up everybody, you know? Things like um, Dresden, I mean, they, they happened. And th- Dresden wasn't even the worst example of this, as we're pointing out. Right. And, like, today, that particular behavior would be undeniably war crimes, right? There is a technicality that it isn't a war crime now. It had to do with their inability to defend themselves. Like, they were able to. They had a gun battery for anti-air. They had um, troops there in the city. So like that's that's why it's not a war crime. Well, it was a, it was a military loophole that was exploited by both sides, and yeah. they were talking about the the rules of warfare, and I think they were devi- they were they were discerned and decided upon by like the Hague Accords. Yeah, there's some tricky thing there though that it was like the uh, the war started before the revisions took effect or something like that. Yes, they did not account for aircraft capabilities and destruction so that was the loophole so anything you could do with the aircraft (laughs) did not apply to the rules of warfare remind me again what the loophole on dropping bombs (laughs) the atom bomb (laughs) what was that one about all about it was to end the war yeah i think it was done right i mean you you they wanted to destroy their morale the Japanese Holy morale. They were afraid shit. that the Japanese would fight to the man all the way back to the emperor. Holy cow. So they dropped a massive bomb and they didn't surrender. So they dropped another massive Holy bomb. Cow. Yeah, they. And then they. Yeah, they. They, they killed. So no war crimes in that one, though. For the sa- <laughs> for the same reason, they didn't have any wow. rules. They didn't have any rules. I mean, that was. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I can understand why a person would have a hard time t- writing about this. Yeah. Yep. Hey, let me ask you a question. Why do you uh, what? Tell me about Mary O'Hare. Yeah, she, it's not really a question. No, but I this book was dedicated to her, and it's that taxi cab driver. So, like, can you explain to me why you think this book was dedicated to Mary O'Hare? Well, she drags out of the narrator 
the fact that this is not to be intended to be a book about war that will be celebrated. You know, a I don't, glamorization. I don't of want, war. and you know, for any of you that are too young to know who John Wayne is, he was just this big cowboy dude in the old days of movies. And you know, I don't want him to be that guy. And he promises her he won't, and that's why he also calls this the Children's Crusade. He said, she says, you guys were just babies going out there and fighting. And he's all, we'll call this the Children's Crusade. That'll be my book. So, Kurt Vonnegut's book is Slaughterhouse Five. The narrator of the book, I guess it's the Children's Crusade. Did you guys translate the Goethe? <laughs> oh. I, I read, <laughs> I cheated and wikied that part. Yeah, it was basically, hey, you know, this was a, this awesome place, and now look at it, and then it's all rubble, you know, basically. All right. So for context, <laughs> for those of you listening, um, Goethe was a German novelist and philosopher, and in 1760, Dresden was bombed. They called it the Cannondale, um, and that would be the day. That would be today, by the way, 262 years ago today. It was the 15th of July, in 1760. That Dresden was... You mean as we're recording it, that was the day. Yep. Holy yep. cow. So Dr Dresden got took a beating then, and you know a lot of it was wrecked. And this guy, Goethe, he went up into one of the towers that survived, and he took a look around the city, and it was, it was a ruin. And it's not unlike what Kurt Vonnegut is doing. You know, he's taking a look around Dresden and writing about the ruin of Dresden. He said it had a, like, a, I can't remember the terminology that he used, but he said it had like an endless capacity for destruction, something like that. Um, but yeah, that, that, that part that's in German is Goethe describing what he sees, and it's the wreckage of German, or wreckage of Dresden. So l let's assume that, let's assume that Vonnegut could have had that translated, but he didn't. Why? Okay, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm willing to pick this one up. At the time when we get that quote, he's lying in bed and reading. He's in a hotel room waiting to go back to Dresden, right? Mm -hmm. And he was given a book along the way to read. I think Mary O'Hare gave it to him, and it was a book about Dresden when it was still considered the jewel of the Elbe or whatnot. So it's this picture book with history and et cetera in it, and he's reading it, and the narrator can't translate it. But there you go. What do you think? Just reading the words as they came, examining right. them, but maybe not knowing anything. I mean, he's fourth generation German. The odds of him knowing German are, are low. How much German do you know, Phil? Uh, maybe 200, 300 words, tops. Mm. Coherently, re coherently reading would be difficult. Yeah, did you read that successfully? No. I mean, I can pick up words and concepts, but that's not comprehension. Yeah. Yeah, sure. On your previous readings of other uh, Vonnegut books, ATN, is he like a simple sentence writer also like this? I mean... I would call it conversational. Yeah, it is often conversational, you're right. Um, I don't know, there were elements of this, this first chapter that just like, you know, kind of like sings of like a, a Hemingway novel because, you know, his stuff was all war-based for the most part also. Mm -hmm. um, expats in France and all that other stuff. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, always kind of, or, or sometimes coming back home, you know, the, like the Nick Adams stories. And some of this really feels like a Nick Adams story. And, uh, I don't know who Nick Adams is. Nick Adams is Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> uh, whoever the character in this book is, is Kurt Vonnegut. You know, obviously you kind of feel that's what's going on here. His name is Billy Pilgrim. He is Billy Pilgrim. In this chapter, it's Jan Janssen. <laughs> Jan, I work in I work in Wisconsin. I work in Wisconsin. Yeah. yeah, funny. I don't know what this guy's name is, but he's all over the place, and it's kind of like Phil says. <laughs> well, that's what I got from the Jan Janssen thing is that he comes back from the war and nobody knows who he is. For all, I mean, he could be anybody in the world. That's and that was his mantra. Is like, it's like my name is Jan Janssen, which he's nobody in the grand scheme of things, mm -hmm. and he's gone back to a normal life. And they ask him who he is, and he says, you know, I'm, you know, Jan Janssen. I work in a lumber mill in Wisconsin or whatever. And I took that to mean it was a circular thing. That's what like I mean. He, that's what he mean. was kind of stuck in a, he was stuck in a loop, like Groundhog Day almost. Well, that's what I, I think also. He's stuck in this normal, mundane life, but in reality, he's like screaming to get this out. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, he's constantly trying to relive it, and he's even trying to force it on his buddy from the war, <laughs> O'Hare. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that guy doesn't know, remember anything. It sounds like he's getting on by not getting on with it, you know? <laughs> well, well, he's no, not trying to deal with it. I don't believe he doesn't remember. I think that's what he's, he's, he's like, I don't want to remember is what he's right. really trying to say. You remember the fact that his wife said that he doesn't drink hard liquor anymore right. since the war? Yeah. Yep. I, I suspect any time he drinks hard liquor, I mean, it has an effect on him. Well, that's when uh, the narrator starts calling ex girlfriends and ex. Oh my god, that was ex, amazing! And ex, and it's and he's like, I, oh yeah, I just called the people used to call the operator and say, yeah. could you get me the number of Joe Blow? Yeah, <laughs> Mrs. This Lady. You know, he calls it a disease. Yeah, and I'm like, he's drunk dialing people. That's it's right. hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of drunk drunk texting, it's drunk dialing. No, 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 it's fine. There were plenty of drunk phone calls in the past. Sure. I mean, I've gotten some. I'm sure you have too. Oh my goodness. No, it was more leaving it a pager blow up or something. Like yeah, that. but no, it was <laughs> It was funny, not but not funny because I think I get it. It's like so he drunk called his friend on a dime in the middle of the night. His you know, O'Hare's his friends entire... up. Yeah, exactly. Everybody so else he. is asleep. That's right. And he said, "Oh, well, you know, hey, it's uh, it's it's me, uh, you know. Let's hang out, talk about the war." And he said, "He's just like he had no trouble believing that it was him. He's like he was up, he was reading. Everybody else yeah. was asleep, and they're both the same way." And and um, Kurt Vonnegut, he what did he say? Is like he drinks too much, and he's got breath like mustard gas and something else. Roses and roses. Well, okay, fine. But then he also talks about his dog, which he does he takes out or lets in in the middle of the night, and he said, "My dog doesn't doesn't care about my mustard gas breath." And I'm like, "Wow, that's 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 like a that's like the first emotional support animal." Yeah. Yeah, this guy yeah. obviously has some major PTSD, right? Yeah, for sure. When I was a kid growing up and you know, uh Vietnam was still a thing people kind of talked about, but it wasn't taught in school or anything like that. Um, yet, you know that all those people came back and they were like spit on and rocks thrown at them and everybody hated their guts for all the things that were going on. World War II heroes, we love you. And you don't think about that reaction as like still at the same time coinciding with someone like being tortured you know <laughs> inside because you're loved you know you got your job back the ladies are you know not gonna work at the factory anymore and uh men don't deal with this kind of stuff anyway right <laughs> yeah not real men right not real men <laughs> well we also have an author who was there cleaning up he was you know he was a prisoner of war in dresden and cleaning up the bodies after the bombing. So he was even on the wrong side of the war, you know, at one point. He was seeing the, the devastation up close. Like, he lived through the bombing, which I don't, I don't know how common of an experience that would have been for an American GI. Uh, towards the end of the... I, like I said, the Battle of the Bulge just finished. So they wouldn't have to be cleaning up civilian casualties because there were no American civilians there. There were no British, Russian. There were no... There were no Allied civilians there. It was military. So the only thing he'd have to deal with is dealing with the bodies of civilians. And that has to that has to hurt. Do you know what I mean? I read a fair bit about Dresden just because I, I was ignorant and I wanted to know. And it doesn't sound like it was a nice place to be right afterwards or during. So I don't know. I don't know. Well, so just, you know, I have a hard time. There was one section in there. It was at page seven in our book where the war was over and he was being guarded by Russian soldiers. And it was like, a vast array of like allied, a very diverse allied group of prisoners. And the Americans had captured all these Russian soldiers. So I'm a little fuzzy on this, but so on a dime, as soon as the war was over, like Russians and Americans were already at war with each other and holding each other prisoner. Yeah. I was kind of confused on that also just a bit. Yeah, I thought they were trading for people that the Germans had had. Oh, prisoner. that makes sense. I don't. I don't think it was. The, the, why would you trade if you were allies? No, it says we were for. It said the Russian soldiers were guarding us, and they weren't guarding us from the Germans because the mm. war was over. 
is that Englishmen, Americans, Dutchmen, Belgians, Frenchmen, Canadians, South Africans, New Zealanders, Australians, thousands of us about to stop being prisoners of war. He said on the other side were thousands of Russians and Poles and Yugoslavians and so on, guarded by American soldiers. And the exchange happened one for one. So it was the Russians holding us prisoner and apparently us holding uh, Russian and Poles and Yugoslavs prisoner. And they exchanged one for one. So it, I mean, it did not take very long for American Russians to just like sw swap. I did, did, did you guys understand that? I am I am not as versed in post World War II. <laughs> uh, well, I read it the way you're saying it, but I thought when Adrian said what he said, that kind of makes sense. You know, maybe it was just like uh, how he perceives it. You know. Um, oh, that's true. It might be how he perceives it, but you know, the trading is like, it's just, oh, these people are going over here and these people are going over here. And I don't know. Oh, um, well, it might've been an eco who wants to pick up the tab. Maybe. Sure. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's because they were, I, I don't know, but you know, there was a lot of looting going on. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like the crux of his story. And he said the know, climax was going to be the, the shot of that his friend or whatever they got killed for stealing a teapot when everybody was stealing everything and the no apparently not though because i think i think well, i know what did. happened there we yeah okay so there's the the bombing of dresden which lasts three days and then for the days after that that's when they're doing the cleanup right they're cle pulling the bodies out getting them ready to be taken off carted away and buried etc right and it was probably then that that guy was looting and he got busted by germans tried and then executed for looting the dead then the war is over, the Germans surrender, and then I suspect everybody looted. Hmm. Right? Because how would, how would you know, Billy Pilgrim slash Kurt Vonnegut have a sword from an SS soldier while he's a prisoner of war? He couldn't. Hmm. Okay. Well, that might be, again, to, like, who's going to pick up the tab for taking care of these, these soldiers? Does that make sense? I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Let us know in the comments down below. Yes, yes, because I don't comprehend how he was still a prisoner being guarded by Russians right, three weeks after the war ended. When you walk away from this first chapter, which I think we're pretty much ready to do, like I don't see any reason to super, super dwell on things. How, how do you walk away from this first chapter? Like, What are your expectations going forward? And did you get anything else out of that that you think is worth sharing? I'm a little concerned about reading forward because I mean starting from the get-go you're talking about thousands of men women and children and civilians being dead and also the counterpoint of so it goes which was interesting the so it goes thing is kind of like a that's just how it is what's uh yeah there's no point in complaining about it it's a mantra it's... you tell yourself to keep yourself sane and and, and, and dealing with it. So do you guys remember when he was at the University of Chicago and he was talking yes. to some guy who was like, he was on the committee on social thought. Don't read anything more into what I'm saying than my interpretation of Vonnegut is Vonnegut is interpreting as like some armchair liberal intellectual pretending to know what happened over there. Right. So now that guy who wants to talk about, you know, Germany and all that stuff, he starts talking about how all the Jews, <laughs> the soap um, and the candles were all made out of the fat of Jews. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. And I was thinking, like, interesting that he doesn't say so it goes. But he was responding to that person, I know, I know, I know. But I, right. I kind of have a feeling right. like it's... You can substitute so it goes there also. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Like, to me, that was him as a younger man mm -hmm. when he was still pretending it being hard, mm -hmm. you know? Because right after that, he says that we all came back from the war and we were harder people. Right. I don't know how long it was later that he went and met Mary O'Hare and her husband, wherever that was. Mm -hmm. But by then, he had changed his mind completely. And, you know, he was he was not hard. Like, I think he had already confronted the fact that he did not want to be hardened by it. Like he, he found it disturbing and uh, didn't like it. I don't know. That's just how I took that. The I know, I know, I know thing, you know, in the, the car accident where he saw the guy get crushed and he's talking to the girl eating the three musketeers bar. 
And he's like, nah, I saw lots of stuff worse. He uses a lot of, like, continual imagery. Even within, like, that same paragraph, he's talking about how it's an iron uh, elevator. And it has, mm-hmm. like, iron lattice work. And it's iron ivy. Yeah. And iron cross. And then that was the thing that ultimately killed the dude, crushed him in his car. Yeah, but I thought it was weird how the level of detail he went into that imagery is completely doing counterpoint with how he describes his life up until that point. Because everything after the war, it's just like, oh, I met a girl who was, you know, had too much baby fat, we had kids. And so it's almost like his life, again, my name is Jan Janssen and so on and so forth, but he's had a very simple life and he doesn't focus on that at all because what's really hanging over his life is this... This This story can't get past. Yeah, exactly. And that's part of it. And so I don't know why, but I think that that particular circumstance when he he focused on this weird details about how the elevator was constructed and then just like kind of glossed over how it actually happened i think that is him also retreating into uh, a mental mental security thing does that make sense yeah. Where and she was like, oh, and she was like testing him. She's like, those wi- the women who were who were reporters when all the men went to war were beastly. Yeah, he called her beastly. Yep, and she was, and she, like she said, she's eating a Snicker bar, talking about well, exactly describe how he died and all these other issues, but she wasn't there herself to actually see it. And I'm not trivializing her in any way, but he's like, I've seen worse. But at the same time, it is a reminder well, that that also spared him having to describe it again, right? You think that was a retreat? I, it's possible. He, you know, she just wants to know because she's curious, right? And he's seen it, and he doesn't like it. So why would he give her? You know, why would he explain it again and dwell on it again for her benefit? Oh, but is it? He thinks she's beastly. Is this the same woman that said, "Well, you know, what did the wife think about it?" And she's like, "Well, she hasn't been yeah. informed yet." And like, "Well, yeah. call her up and pretend to say you're Captain Finn of the police department and find it. You mm-hmm. know, see how she responds." I'm like, you know, whiskey tango foxtrot, like. Yeah, she is beastly. Who gave this? I mean, who gave her authority to give him authority to call her and to pretend to be somebody else just so you could get a story? Perry White. Maybe that's the difference, though. You know, the people he said that he liked the people that had gone to the war and done real fighting and then come back and didn't like war anymore. He said those were the people he liked the best. Well, they're also the people that actually were involved in fighting a war. Well, he could relate to this girl. This girl is not. Right? She didn't go to the war, so she's interested in all these sort of details, and he no longer is. I don't know. I, I think there's a, a reasonable reading in there. Did you guys laugh out loud about the bird, the po tea wheat? I had, I had to look up what that meant. <laughs> I laughed out loud. Well, explain that to me because I didn't. Oh, it's just funny, man. It's just funny. He's a, I forget what the context even is. He's handing his book over to get published. He's like, here's my book on Dresden. I didn't, I didn't realize it was going to be this hif- difficult to write, but then again, like, what do you say after a massacre? You know, I guess there's nobody, there's not supposed to be anybody left after a massacre to say anything. There should only be birds. And what do birds say? Po, tea, wheat. That's right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, I had to look it up. And the, the very first, the very last line uh-huh. of chapter one was that Po, tea, tweet, right? Uh, yeah. Wheat. With a, yep. qu- yeah. Po, tweet, wheat, whatever, with a, with a question mark. <laughs> Yeah, and so I had to look it up what it meant, and he said from the context of the novel, it you know it, the bird is a symbolic thing of um, the la- having the lack of anything intelligent to say about the war. Oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah, yeah. But the thing is, is that that was a good war right <laughs> i i don't know man i don't know uh you, these guys even when it's like righteous you come back and speaking of righteous wars they talk about the children's crusade in this and uh it was anything but <laughs> yeah that i mean that's a lot that's a history lesson in itself yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they go through that in this but yeah um, I Casually. assume that I hopefully that didn't have any propaganda when they were when he was researching the Children's Crusade. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It sounded like he got he got his information out of a like a miniature version of an encyclopedia or something. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. 
Um, we'll take a look at your notes if you took any. Take a look at your book uh, for anything that might have been underlined that you think might be worth uh, bringing in that didn't already get brought in. Yeah, uh, he um, he goes back to college when he uh, and he takes like an anthropology. He like he's getting an anthropology degree or something like that. And he learns that, like, there's, st- there's, he learns in class that there's no difference between anybody. And, yeah. uh, and his father, like, later on, and his father later on says, you know, why did you never have a villain in any of your stories? And, uh, he's all, this is what I learned in college, you know? <laughs> Everybody thinks they're the good guy. Yeah. Right. Well, I think that's what I'm saying. Uh, I mean, that's what I think he's saying. Yeah. You think both those things say the same thing? I do. I mean, what well, he's, but he didn't learn that until he went to college. You know what I mean? Is like after the war. After the war, yeah. Um, I feel like I don't know, man. Maybe he was like searching for you know the answer or something. But you know, it got taught to him this way. Well, so you know? so I I I think I interpreted it a little bit differently. At when when I read that, I. Th- my thought was that what we're seeing is the social programming, like we are being socially programmed on how to believe that everybody's the same. Yeah, exactly. Or any, yeah. any other variation of social programming going on in society today. And he apparently not just today though. Well, not just today. I'm not just, no, it never is. I mean, it was going on then. Mm-hmm. Oh man. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Well, that's how a, a person that comes out of a military kind of situation. I had a buddy that he, we were going to college together. This is when I read this for the first time. Uh, and he uh, had done all that war stuff. He saw dead people. He got shot at, you know, that type of stuff. And he hated it so much and never wanted to go back. But integrating back into society and seeing all the people that he couldn't stand he went back <laughs> how sad is that you know well that war is better than, <laughs> than civilian life. and then real life yeah sometimes uh you know it's a recidivism of a, of a certain sort it is yeah it is but in this particular context i think that uh, vonnet clearly recognized he was being manipulated by social pressures and he was conforming because not conforming was painful or, or, or not productive or you become a social outcast or any variation of that. But, you know, just looking into how he responded, he's like, well, you know, that's what I was taught in college. And I, th- I think he's very sensitive to that. And I think people today on the same social pressures we have today are very sensitive about what we say and what we don't say. And the same is true for him. And that's why he wrote the way he wrote. I didn't get any of that. Oh, well, clearly I'm a more evolved in comp- comprehending the story. You didn't think it had anything to do with anything? I don't I mean I don't know. I didn't I didn't read that deeply into that thing. Um I know that that is still taught. Well, essentially, I mean, if you want to be popular he was writing this book for a lot of reasons, but it certainly wasn't to be antagonistic to the social norm. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I think it was like um, catharsis. Maybe I'm not sure, but I think I feel like like all of these things are the problems on why he was having such a hard time, uh, you know, getting this novel out. You know, writing this mm-hmm. book. This is admittedly bad book. <laughs> he said it was a failure. It was a failure. I mean, it probably it might be. Yeah, you know. might be a grand failure. You sure. know, I don't think this book has ever been out of print. It's it, again. It's a strange thing that we're talking about a book written by a guy, written by a guy. You know. Well, it did feel like a bit of a mess as far as like he was all over the board, uh, but it didn't bother me. Like I felt like the important information was delivered in such a way that it didn't matter what order it was in. Right. So if that's the way the book goes forward, I'm fine with that so long as I enjoy it and I understand it. Um, and if we have to dig a little bit to understand it more thoroughly, so much the better. You know, it's candy. Meat on the bones, as it were. All right, do you guys have anything to add? Or are you guys ready to wind it down? I'm ready to wind down. Phil? I've babbled enough. Yeah, I'm good. I've said my piece. Are you going to be okay with it going okay. forward? You know, of course I am. Um, but uh, like I said, it's just like based on the 
the very first chapter, I'm like, I, I'm already emotionally invested, and I hope that doesn't cloud my judgment. <laughs> oh, it's going to get weird, yeah. man. Yeah, I think it's going to get weird. I think this is the only chapter that's going to be like this one. The rest of them are going to be um, from, uh, you know, following Billy Pilgrim through an actual story. So I have high hopes. But I'm also not not shocked or surprised how it started. And you guys don't know anything that's going to happen going forward. Why would we? Haven't seen the movie. Uh, haven't read the book. You accidentally wikied a little bit too much information. No. I know the name of the aliens because of the introduction. I know that there are aliens because of the introduction. And I know that he referred to himself as an earthling at some point. What's funny is that I didn't even know this was a sci-fi novel. Why would we read it if it wasn't? Well, I, that's my question because the entire first chapter was nothing but his journey on how to produce a historical novel. Yeah. So I'm yep. like, this is history. Uh, why are we reading this? But uh, again, I don't know about trust the author, but certainly trust Yule since he recommended this. I do. He has pretty good taste usually. Even if he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, it, you don't have to know what you're talking about. Really, really, I just want to read books I like. Uh, most, I hate mostly. watching history, though. I'm just a stupid American when it comes to How would that. you feel if you had written a novel that was using bad information and then Ooh. it gets corrected? The guy redacted his, uh, he corrected his, his error later on when he found out that the information had come from a propaganda machine. Irving. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I'm welcoming any any information or you know anybody correcting me i don't care my life my, my reputation isn't at stake i don't think well we're not historians so right. you know well, as, a, as a scientist it's almost counterintuitive but i love being corrected because the worst crime a scientist commit is to propagate lies and misinformation well yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. are you allowed to accidentally do that or you know is it a malicious act always <laughs> well no it's just it's just you have to constantly correct yourself and you can't ever let ego get the best of you right but you know i think about how kurt vonnegut got this number so off i imagine if you're just like hauling bodies away for days on end it's and you know there's other groups out there doing the same thing it's easy for you to just over exaggerate the horror of what you just saw well, hold on. He did not give us any specific numbers. No, he didn't. But no, he just said it was worse than Hiroshima. Hiroshima, yeah. Right, and he got that information from Irving Frank, and Irving Frank got it from Goebbels. He never actually used a real number. He just made a comparison, and the comparison was made from faulty information. That's okay. That's true. All of that's true. Um, and but you go with what you know, and apparently he did. And he was on the ground. You know, he saw he saw hundreds of. Parts of bodies and other, you know, and yes. whole body. But the other thing is, is that this is a work of fiction, you know, and you know, even if you're gonna like stick by it, you know, I don't care, I'm sticking by it. You can stick by it in the story; it doesn't have to. Well, be that's re- that's true, but I get the I get the impression like the entire first chapter is you know ninety five percent plus true, if that makes any sense. But he he was basing it upon the information he had available to him because the yeah, you know, they he didn't have the internet, he didn't have well, he also didn't count bodies. That too, I'm sure it was horrific enough, you know. All right, so we are going to get on to reading chapter two. The beginning of the story. The beginning of the actual story about Billy Pilgrim. We're going to leave Kurt Vonnegut, our narrator, I think, behind and get on to reading chapter two. I am looking forward to it. I think this was a pretty good start for a novel, and I was, you know, I'm interested and I want to keep going, obviously. So, do you guys have anything to add? Are we done? See you next time. It's a wrap. Welcome back, guys. It was. It's good to be back. It's good to talk to you guys. Yeah, let us know what you think. Or don't. Or don't. And if, he, or if don't. you have a negative comment, keep it to yourself, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Post it on Reddit. It's just, it's, just, it's just like your mother said. If you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. Why wow. do you mention this though? Because we're not getting we're not getting negative comments. No, so why would you mention no, well, this I, one's I, going I'm to just you. kidding, you know. And the truth the truth is, I uh, I appreciate um, I appreciate some context because especially in this first chapter where I read this and I thought it was actually pretty decent on World War II history, but a lot of things came out that uh, you know it just made me question what I knew or thought I knew. And I you know whatever if somebody has you know two minutes to put in two cents, please do so. 
Okay. All right, so um, like I said, we're going to get on to reading. You guys do the same thing. We'll see you in nine days or thereabouts. Take care, everyone. Thanks, all. You'll say goodbye, please. Good night. I already did. Ha, 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 ha.